Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our session today. Let me start with introductions. My name is Martin Zujek. I'm working as a senior architect for the technical marketing team. Today, I'm joined by Rob Zilowski. Rob is working as the real architect. He's the field architect. And today, we are going to talk about optimization and performance and scalability best practices. Now, you can see only two of us standing on the stage, but there's actually a lot more people that have been working with us on the content that we are presenting today, so we would like to give them credit. Many of them are actually in this room. Oh, yes. <laughs> And I would like to share with you one story from my early days as Citrix administrator. I had a customer and they opened the support tickets and the support ticket was <coughs> saying, logons are so slow that it's a security issue for us, which I was like, what's happening? So we jumped on the call with the customer and first sentence he said was, 45 minutes logon times were perfectly fine. Now that it's over one hour, that's unacceptable because we need to have one employee, we give him all the passwords, he goes to the office first, log on all the machines, and then the rest of the company arrives. So, what we found out, the problem was very simple. They, we were using the batch script as a logon script, and what, what the batch is doing is that it always reads the line, executes it, goes back to home directory. And they were accessing servers in Czech Republic, but they were based in Africa, so it would always Execute line, go back to Africa. Execute line, go back to Africa. Two minutes later, we fix this. They realized that something like half a minute log on times exist, which they didn't know. For them, 45 minutes was perfectly normal. So this was my early lesson when I realized log on times, performance, optimizations, it really, really matters because this is where you are dealing with the business. This is the big benefit that you can provide to the business. Now, I will briefly talk about how to optimize, and these are the recommendations that I always give. First one is uh, focus on making the big impact. And what this means is understand what's the challenge, what's the goal, what you are trying to fix. So I used to be a field consultant before, and I had a couple of projects where the customer hired consulting to fix the logon times, and they told us we spent two weeks trying to optimize group policy. So, okay, we had a look. Wanted to see what's the logon time duration. We found out the, the group policy is two seconds. That was not a problem they had. They had <coughs> problem with printers, but they never actually checked what's the problem they are trying to fix. Focus on making the big impact. Really understand if you are trying to fix the logon times, what is taking most of the time. Second recommendation, and that's pretty much related to this one, is uh, find some metrics that you can measure and always measure before and after. Use the tools, use the login VSI, use the Citrix directory, control app, whatever you have. And one of the reasons why I recommend this is uh, what many people, the way how they approach optimizations is open Google, find all the recommendations they can and just apply to the systems. And you will find out that many legacy best practices can actually have negative impact on your environment. Uh, the good example of this one is disable the task offloading in PVS. That's not needed since Windows Server 2008. Many people still do it. The last recommendation is the user acceptance testing. And this is important, especially if you are focused on the user density or if you are doing optimizations for security, you are, trying to remove, you are trying to minimize the attack surface, you are trying to remove everything that you can. Always validate what's the impact on user experience. It's very nice if you can put on 10% more VMs, but if all your users are going to suffer, that's not a good decision to make. So let's talk about the Windows optimizations. And what we are pretty much doing is, uh, oh, sorry, I have one more. So I forgot to mention, I own the Citrix Optimizer tool, and one question that I got from almost every customer I'm talking to is, can you tell me if I disable this one service, what's going to be the performance benefits? I don't know. <laughs> I guess nobody knows. The reason why is the way how we optimize Windows is that you make a lot of changes, 
All of them are small, but together they are making big impacts. And uh, typically the optimizations that we are doing on Windows, uh, first one is one of the oldest, just disabling the services that you don't need. There are over 200 services in Windows 10. Uh, in the latest build, there's actually even more. Uh, same with scheduled task. In Windows XP, we used to have four. Now we have two, over 200. Uh, the next one, and I will come back to this one, is removing the built-in applications. Because the way how they work is when you install them, you install them to machine. When the user logs on for the first time, there is provisioning inside his profile. The firewall policies are created, the new isolation environment for that application is created, and so on. And this actually has very significant negative impact. The last one is uh, active setup. And if you don't remember what is active setup, just a quick reminder, you log on, you see the blank screen. In the top left corner, you are going to see that your experience is being optimized for Outlook Express or whatever. Now, this is very old and legacy technology. Microsoft is not really using it. They use it for backwards compatibility. I wrote an article about the, the way how Active Setup works, and I couldn't find it anymore. I couldn't find it in Google Cache. And I was told that Google Cache is being deleted after 15 years. So I don't know when I wrote it, but definitely a long, long time ago. Now, one of annoying things about Active Setup is that it's being triggered by explorer.exe. It's the child process of the shell. But what happens if you don't have the shell is that this is never executed. So if you run published desktop, you are going to get configuration from Active Setup. If you run published applications, you are not going to get it. So we recommend disable Active Setup. Have a look at what you have there. Maybe you need to use it, but if you don't, just delete it. Finally, miscellaneous. This is the mix of all the typical best practices using the high performance mode, disabling the last access timestamp on NTFS, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to show you uh, pretty much what's the impact of optimizing your operating system. And what I'm going to show is the data from ICTR. We have them here in the audience. And they are going to have session tomorrow, the SYN 215. And I highly, highly recommend you should go there, because they are going to show a lot more data than I'm going to do today. The data that I will show you is based on the build 1809. We don't do 1903 because it's not released yet officially, so we are still waiting for the official release from Microsoft. So after applying all those optimizations that I had listed, all those different categories, first result is what you would expect. It's free capacity. You can just get more users on your servers without buying any additional hardware. So in this test, we went from 77 all the way to 90 users. The reason why we went to this higher number of users is mostly caused by the CPU consumption. So when you optimize the images, the CPU utilization, the average utilization is going to be lower, and it's also going to be more predictable. You are not going to get the peaks. We see similar benefits with the memory. So what you see is that on optimized images, you have a lot more free memory after the startup that you have on the default Windows 10 image. The big one that we are always seeing, we see typically this number somewhere between 25 to 40%. That's the reduction in the read IOPS. Uh, you can also see reduction in the write IOPS. That's still significant, just not as big as the read IOPS. Now, one important thing is that you don't do optimizations only for the scalability. That's something that matters mostly to you as administrators, and your end users don't really care. But there are benefits that you also get for the end users themselves. The best example is the logon time. So by doing the default optimizations, we can immediately reduce the logon time that you have. Second metric that is important is the ICA uh, round trip time. Th this means how snappy is the environment. If I click, how long does it take until I actually see some response from the remote system? And on optimized images, it's, it's just much more user-friendly. It's more responsive. The users are more happy because they see that something is responding to what they are doing. So that was Windows 10. Now we are going to look at uh, Windows Server 
2019. And as expected, when, once we optimize the Windows Server, we can get more users on the physical hardware. And we went all the way up from 99 to 100 users. And here I usually like to see if people are sleeping or they are paying attention. <laughs> and yes, there's only one more user that was added. And what we could do with these results, because they are not that good for this presentation, I would rather not like to say that we have 50% more users, is we could just ignore the data that we don't like, or we could try to find out why is the client operating system and server operating system different. So we decided to go to take the second option. So what we did, and this was done using Citrix Optimizer, is that we had a look at the different categories of optimizations that you are doing, and we are trying to find out what's the actual impact they are having on performance. So we went to the disabling services, schedule task, miscellaneous, and so on, and what you are seeing is removing built-in application gives you almost all the benefits of optimizations. All the others will give you a little bit of performance, but by removing the built-in application, you are going to get most of the benefits. So this is the number of users that we can put on server, and all the other metrics that we've seen are pretty much following this. So when we check the CPU, remove built-in application, you get most of the benefits. Uh, Logon times, for example, remove built-in applications, you get most of the benefits. So in conclusion, if you are afraid of optimizing your images, if you want to make, if you are afraid of the stability, compatibility of the system, whatever, just by removing the built-in applications, you are already making huge difference on the Windows 10 operating system that you are deploying. Now, we've been talking about the benefits of optimizations, no matter how you do it. Now we are going to talk about how you actually can optimize. And how many of you heard about Citrix Optimizer? I would love to take a picture of this. This is awesome. <laughs> now, Citrix Optimizer, uh, the way how we always wanted to develop it is that we wanted to build the framework. We, we didn't want it to build the one-time tool that can be used only for one thing. We wanted to build a tool that can optimize different things and that can be used as a best practices analyzer and so on. So we really wanted to build a Swiss army knife that can be used for many different things. Now, what we built, what we have today, is more like Swedish army knife. It's doing only one thing, but it's doing it really, really well. <laughs> and the current generation of the optimizer is used just to optimize the operating system images. That's what we have today. Now, how many of you are using version 2.5? It's a tricky question. <laughs> 2.5 was released yesterday at 11 p.m. So, so this is the first time ever when I can actually talk about this new release. And we, re we were really trying to release it for this specific section, session that we have today. What Optimizer is doing is pretty much all the optimizations, different categories of optimizations that I was talking about before. In this release, we support 11 different operating systems or different operating system builds. Uh, we already have the 1903 ready. We are just waiting for Microsoft to release it as generally available operating system, which is not available today. Now, the way how Optimizer has been always designed is that it's uh, pretty much completely based on the PowerShell. The engine is written in PowerShell. Different modules or the plugins are written in PowerShell. Reporting, logging, everything is written in PowerShell. And we provide integration with a lot of different tools. By default, we ship Optimizer with the, in the PowerShell mode and with the user interface. But what we know is that a lot of customers are using optimizers with other tools. Two most popular that I'm seeing is the BISF. Uh, we work really closely with BISF. We always provide them with the latest beta versions or the earliest beta versions. Uh, we always make sure that they work really well together. The second integration that we are seeing a lot is with SCCM. 
And we actually added a lot of uh, features in this new release, as well as the previous one, to make it very easy to integrate with SCCM. Now, when you are using optimizer, optimizer can run in three different modes. Uh, first mode is analyze, which is read only access. We just analyze the operating system and give you recommendations what you should change. Second one is execute, where we make those changes for you. The last one, and it's available only for, from PowerShell, is the rollback. The rollback is technically maybe the most complicated component of the optimizer because we don't just enable things back, we actually record exactly what optimizer is doing, so we are doing the real rollback and revert it back to whatever it was before. It doesn't matter if it was optimized, unoptimized, halfway done, so we are really reverting the changes and not just enabling everything. Now, with that being said, I would like to show you the demo of the current version of Optimizer. So most people are using Optimizer from the user interface. And I believe that the user Interface is similar to jokes. If you have to explain it, it's probably not too good. So what I decided to do is that the whole UI has been designed by someone different than me, by one of my colleagues who's a professional designer. And I'm not actually developer responsible for the UI because I know I'm not really good at this. So we added a couple of features in the version 2.5. Uh, the biggest one actually, surprisingly, is a lot of people were complaining, I don't know what's the build of the operating system that I'm using. I know it's Windows 10, but I don't know what exactly you are recommending. So in this, in this version, we automatically scan which operating system you are using, and we are providing you with recommendation for the current operating system that you have. In future, we are thinking about extending this, because this is, again, built inside a framework. So we will be able to find out if you are using, for example, Storefront, DDC, what's actually running on that operating system, and we will recommend you or show you only the templates that are really applicable. The second feature that we implemented in the user interface, and I'm going to mention only a few. We have 18 features in the new release, but these are the ones that I really like, is the marketplace. So we support Citrix Marketplace for the official Citrix templates. We also support third-party marketplaces, which are, and I don't have internet connection. Oh, I do. So the marketplace in this version behaves more like the, let's say, App Store, where you see you have new updates. We do auto-scan. We tell you these are the templates that you should update. Now, to show you the experience with Optimizer, all I do is I just click on the recommended template, and I have options to analyze or optimize. I click on analyze because this is my real laptop, so I don't want to mess it up. So I want to run it in read-only mode. Now, what's happening uh, under the hood is that this is actually the PowerShell engine that is doing all of this. The UI is just a shell that's used to make it easy to use, but it doesn't really have any logic. Once we are done with the analyze, the output is HTML report, where we will show you what is optimized, what is not optimized, and uh, we will also show you how you should optimize it. So what we are seeing is that, for example, a lot of consultants will not optimize images. They will just run this in analyze mode and send the HTML report to responsible team saying, this is how the environment should be configured and should be used. Now. Two more features that, I'm, that have been frequently requested before is uh, we added ability to modify the default user profile. So what we now have in Optimizer is uh, when you are making changes to default user profile, so you specify HKDU as default user, Optimizer will recognize it automatically. It's going to load the default profile on the background, make the changes, and unload it at the end. One more feature that's completely new in this release is uh, we added support where you can actually enable and disable the Windows features. 
And uh, in the next update of the templates, we are going to include some of the features that should be disabled. The best example is the SMB1 support. And we are also making it much easier now if you want to create your own templates. You don't have to know the name of the feature that you want to disable. You can just select it from the list of the features. And we build this support not only for the features. We have this support for services, scheduled tasks, building applications, whatever you have. You don't need to know the name. You just select it from the list. Now, one final feature that I would like to talk about here, and this is going to be really important for us in the future, is that we edit support on the template level, group level, or entry level for conditions. And condition can be any PowerShell code. It, all it needs to do is just return true or false if condition is true. And the way how we are planning to use this in the next version of templates is that we will be able to check, for example, if your VDA is persistent or non-persistent and dynamically decide which optimizations are recommended. We will be able to find out, for example, if you have Office installed and give you recommendations. We will be able to have the logic saying, for example, uh, this is highly secure desktop and there is Google Chrome installed, so we will be able to show you security best practices for the Google, Google Chrome. So this feature potentially brings us to the next generation of the templates, which, are, which we call them intelligent templates, and they are coming later this year. Now, this would be all about optimizing, and now let's talk about the more fun stuff. All right, hi everyone. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit. Oops, the back. Um, and we're gonna talk about things that have to do with log on times, everybody's favorite topic, and configuration, right, as opposed to what we've been talking about. And the first topic here is log on scripts. And, and what I'd like to go back is something Martin brought up, and that's first knowing whether you have a problem before you work on the problem. Because our first thing at the top here says, well, maybe you don't wanna use log on scripts anymore. They've been around a long time. They're often a problem. But if you look in director and your logon scripts take three seconds, don't bother with what we're about to talk about, right? And that's fine, right? You really do have to see where your bottlenecks are for login times before you spend any time working on it because you could be chasing nothing, right? Um, but the biggest issue normally with logon scripts that I've seen in all the customer accounts that are there is that they've been around for a long time. People don't look at them. And they'll have things like, oh, I'm going to Mac a drive to this share. That share doesn't exist anymore, right? So it's sitting there waiting, trying to connect to it, however many times it's trying to connect to it, taking a long time. So if you do have login scripts, you do want to, every month or so, take a look and make sure it's valid, right? And that the things that it's trying to connect to are still there. Um, really important for that. Um, the other thing is you want to look at your login scripts to say, can I pull stuff out of them that can happen at different times, right? GPPs and GPOs are normally a little faster than login scripts at doing things, right? So if you're mapping drives or, or printers, et cetera, you might want to bring those out, right, and put them into a group policy um, or into a third-party application altogether that's better at doing that thing. If you have really long login scripts and you have to because you're mapping a ton of printers and you have to do that, um, that's a good time to look at an alternate mechanism if you really need to cut down your login times, like um, Workspace Environment Manager. Right, which will do printer mappings after you log in as opposed to before you log in. Or even better, there's some really great third-party printer applications out there that install the drivers, manage the drivers for you. They do follow me printing where you, know, you kind of swipe your card and it gives you your print securely. So there's a lot of new functionality out there which would be great to get things out of login scripts and save that time. Um, if you have to use login scripts and you're using 2012 R2 warning, Microsoft for some reason, decided to put this stupid policy in that says wait five minutes before running a login script. So you get logged in, but your login scripts don't run, and then after you need them, they actually run. You can disable that if you need to do that. They went back to the normal way in Windows 10 in 2016, so you don't have to worry about that setting anymore if you're using login scripts. And those are for login scripts defined in group policy, right? Not the ones defined in Active Directory. They work normally, okay? A couple other things here. If you're copying files with RoboCopy in login scripts, just remember the default um, number of retries is a million in RoboCopy. So if you're copying something that's for whatever reason not getting copied, it could be spending a very long time doing that. Um, so you'll probably want to get rid of that as well. Okay. Um, next thing that's kind of interesting, off the separate from login scripts, 
is if you're using login scripts or really you're using anything to set the current user things, I think you're much better off using the new optimizer and switching to do that in the default profile or looking at doing those same settings in HK Local Machine. Oftentimes, settings that you do as user settings will actually work as machine settings and they'll just be applied to every user that logs into that machine. It makes it quicker because it's not really getting applied when the user logs on, it's already done. Um, and then anything that's in your login script that you can actually do with a boot script, much better, right? Because you don't care what happens, how long it takes when the machine boots. You only care about what happens when the user's logging in. So all those things can try to make that, that faster. But really, people are using login scripts a lot less. But again, if they're quick for you and they're doing what you need them to do, don't worry about them. Right? Now, what you probably hear if you talk to such Excel's people and a lot of things is, hey, WEM will make all your login time problems go away. Just use WEM. That'll fix everything. Of course, that's not true, right? Again, know what's wrong with your logins, right? If you have very high GPO times, right, for whatever reason, because you're doing lots of WMI filtering and things that take a long time, WEM might be a solution for that, but you do have to convert your group policies into WEM policies. The advantage there being that you get logged in before those get set, right? So WEM does it after the logon. If you're map doing a lot of network printer mappings in either group policies or logon scripts, WEM will help for that. Right? WEM is fantastic if you have users that use too much of a machine right? and you want to get better session density. You know, it was really designed around managing processor and memory. Right? So if you have those issues, those are really good reasons to use WEM. Otherwise, if you don't have any of those things, WEM's just adding kind of a complicated infrastructure into your environment that you don't need and you have to support. Right? So I'd recommend not using it if you don't need those things as far as that goes. Um, going to switch gears a little bit to profiles. And profiles is, is really interesting, especially in the last few years, because um, you probably know there's a bunch of things happening with containerized profiles, right? So, you know, Microsoft a few months ago bought FSLogix, which has a few really interesting products, right, for profiles. Um, they have an, uh, um, 365 container type thing, which handles stuff for um, Outlook Exchange Center, they also have Profile Container, which does the same thing. And what these technologies that are containerized do is, is similar to app layering. They have a VHDX file that gets mounted before you log in, and they basically take your whole profile and put it into that file. So now you're storing the entire profile and, the, and everything that goes with it, and you don't have to recreate that every time you log in. You just have to mount that disk, right? And we'll talk about times, like how long it takes to do that in a little bit. Um, but from the standpoint of your users, it's really good because everything that they save into their profile gets saved, right? So you know that all the configurations are going to be saved. Um, the FS logic is really neat because it includes things like the OST um, and even the index files for the OST, which is nice, right? You don't have to rebuild those. Um, of course, there's still folder redirection. A lot of people use that. If you're really concerned about login times, don't use folder redirection, right? It does work. Um, it helps if, you know, if you were going to sync a lot of big files, right, then kind of it's a trade-off, right, between those file syncing and when that happens versus login time. But it does add significantly to login time as it has to set up the shell folders and kind of redirect those when you log in, right? Um, we used to use local mandatory profiles to really speed up login time. In fact, in Windows 7, you could see 40-second uh, increases in login time speed just by doing a local mandatory profile where it would copy it instead of creating it. Now, some of that was, Martin talked about um, the initial setup tasks that ran those things and getting rid of that, but some of it was just much faster. For some reason, Windows 10, and I haven't figured it out, but I know it's true, doesn't help at all. There's no performance increase at all for mandatory profiles. So if you want to use it because you want to pre-configure things, that's good. However, tiles and um, start menu items, et cetera, with Windows 10 don't work really well in a mandatory profile. So. We've been staying away from it for those things. Last thing on the list is the app layering user layer. That's really a different animal, right? That's not profiles, that's everything. So once that gets mounted, if you're using app layering, anything the user does or the machine does while it's mounted gets saved. So that has some big advantages. Um, UWP apps, for instance, Microsoft didn't want to make our lives easy when they implemented those. The permissions for UWP apps of who's allowed to use them and who's been able to use them are not 
defined in the user profile, right? Actually defined on the machine under program data with SIDs and other things. So if you start an app, you would normally get permissions to it. If you pin it to your taskbar, right, it has an icon, et cetera. So um, what happens is you log off, you log back in, you think everything's gonna work because you're using FS Logic. it should capture all the stuff in your profile, and what you find is you have no icon for your pinned app, and when you click on it, nothing happens because you don't actually have permissions to run the app anymore. If you actually go to your start menu and open it, that will re-give you permissions, and then it actually shows up on your taskbar, and then you can run it, but it's just so weird, right? It doesn't happen with the user layer. The user layer will work normally because it's saving all that information that's outside the profile as well. But beware, you have to re-architect your whole solution to use both app layering and the user layer from what you would normally do, but can help there. All right, moving on a little bit, Citrix profile management, I think it's awesome, right? Basically works out of the box, you turn it on, you do a few settings, take all the default syncs and things that it does, and for the most part, it does what everybody needs, right, for syncing the profile information that you need. So one quick note, I'm sorry. I used to be field architect in the responsible for Middle East and Africa. And especially in Africa, we've seen a lot of deployments that were not really well done. The only exception was the Citrix profile management that often worked better than, for example, in the Western Europe, because they didn't configure it, and out of the box, it just works amazing. Right. <laughs> so good product. Um, Citrix profile management has a um, feature called streaming, right? And when we're talking about login times, that's what you're gonna want to enable. What streaming does is basically syncs a minimal amount of things with when you log in, and then when you actually access things, it syncs them then, right? So it's logging you in first, and then kind of syncing stuff later. The things I've seen from that, I've seen anywhere from a minute to a three and a half minute login benefit just by implementing streaming over CPM by itself. Right. It really depends on all these bottlenecks you have and, and what's going on, but it can be drastic to benefit on Windows 10 by using streaming with CPM. Okay. Um, of course, there are policies, and you'll look, there'll be some things where you go, okay, I want to sync this thing, and you, you can easily go configure that. You can actually use WEM to set up CPM, and it comes with a whole default set of policies that are really easy to implement. So if you're already using WEM, it's, it's easy then to add the policies for Citrix profile management. You can do this in Citrix policies and then you can do it as GPOs, right? Pretty easy to implement overall. Um, one thing though, if you are using CPM with the user layer, right? And some people do that because they want to have their, most of the settings roam to different machines where they might only have one machine that's used for a user with a user layer. Don't set to delete profiles on logout not going to make the user layer happy because it's going to delete the profile, right? So not going to get what you want out of that. All right. I've been doing a lot of work recently with customers that have been having issues with things in Windows 10 just not working as you would think they would. Uh, and of course, this is a really a moving target. Every version, it changes. But I decided to put this chart together to try to explain what that looks like for everyone. Um, so if you're interested in, hey, I really need Outlook to work with OST and stream files, and I need Outlook indexing to work right out of the bat, right? what you can see there is you can use um, CPM plus the Outlook container for CPM, right? which is something that uh, lets you, through Citrix Profile Management, store the OST. And it also has a unique way to, to store the index files, which are run by the system. So they did some neat stuff there. They're not run by the user um, for that, and that works really well. You can also use FS Logics to do that, right? It's kind of designed to do that, right? The app layer and user layer, interestingly enough, doesn't do the index file, right? Because it's managed by the system um, and it's a boot thing and we haven't got our two products together yet. So we are gonna work on that hopefully, but right now uh, we rebuild the indexes if you use the user layer, you would still get the other parts of that, right? The next thing is that, um, start menu and UWP stuff. If you need the taskbar icons to work, right, then you'll want to use the user layer. It's really the only way. But if you don't need that, right, and you're gonna tell people don't pin things to the taskbar, the start menu stuff works. It kind of breaks each time and then you fix it each time, right? So they, they used to have uh, the ability to open the application, but the next time they log in, when they click on it, they'll get the ability again. Now, as Martin said at the beginning of this, my preference to all the UWP stuff would be just take it out and don't use it, but some people might need to use it, right? Hopefully it's not that you need to use it for calculator, but that, <laughs> believe it or not, that's generally what people leave in. 
Okay. Um, the other things you can see on there as well. Uh, one interesting thing is CPM now has a profile container, they call it, and what it really is is a large file cache container. So it's a, another one of these VHDX files where you can say the Citrix files cache will go because it's big and it'll live on there. Or maybe you put your Chrome caches in there if you want to have Chrome caches and not you know, exclude them each time, and they'll stay in that file, right? And you, they won't have to get recreated each time that the user logs in. Okay. Next thing. This is kind of important. What do your users think, right, about the experience, right? What's the perceived performance to them? Sometimes it's better, right, for the users that even it's the same time you log them in, they think they're logged in, maybe they can't do anything right away, right? But, but they think things are moving along, right, as part of that. But you, you really want to work on what that timing performance is. And if you look at the native performance for logins, right, what you see is there's a lot of steps to this login process. There's the session initialization, which is the HDX setup time, right? How long does it take me once I click on the icon in storefront or receiver to actually get something going to the machine? Then there's login authentication, profile load, GPO processing, login scripts, drive mappings, et cetera, right? That can take a really long time. Citrix does have some technologies here that can help if you're doing Citrix virtual apps, right? Remember, though, figure out where your problems are, right? And if you have a problem, and then try to tackle it. If your problem is, hey, the whole thing just takes too long, and there's nothing I can do about it because I can't really make any of those things shorter, well, a couple things we can do. First, if you're using such virtual apps, pretty much, I think, always use session lingering, right? What happens here is the customers click on an app, and a lot of people do this. They use one app at a time, and then they close it out, and they go in again. Well, if I only have one app open on a session, and I close it, I'm going to get logged out. Right? Then I, right away, I'm going to click another app. If that's actually on, could be on the same session, I'm going to log in again the whole time. What lingering does is it says, no, don't log them out for X number of hours or minutes. Right? I usually do 30 minutes for this. Right? And it'll leave them logged in long enough that then when they click the next login time, it jumps ahead into the stage of where they are, and they don't have to log in again. Right? And it's pretty cool, because you can also say, if the load exceeds a certain amount, then log them out. That way, you're getting your sessions back, so you're not having sessions on there that you don't need and using more than you need. Right? So this is a great technology. It's server side. It doesn't matter how you're accessing the sessions. You can use this, which is important. Okay. So another thing, right, which is pretty cool, called session pre-launch. This one's a little harder and, and not as applicable to everything. But what happens here is, when you log into your workspace app or, or receiver, if you're still using that, you've predefined something that's going to get a dummy app that's going to get launched, and it's going to create a session for that user, right? Automatically, it's going to open a session. And it does pretty much all the steps except for launch the app, right? So it's sitting there at a session without an app launch, but it's done the whole logon process. So thinking about that, you know, that's not good for every kind of use case, right? If I'm a doctor and I'm logging into a thin client that's immediately going to open my EMR when I log in, I'm not saving any time with this because that's going to run that process anyway. Um, but if I'm not, if I'm someone that's logging into a real desktop that has a, a receiver or workspace app, this could save significantly if they're going to use a particular delivery group all the time. Right? You can launch this. You can actually configure this to be launched on a schedule um, by machine or by user, if that makes sense for you to do. Um, and certainly double hop scenarios where they're getting either an HSD or a VDI desktop and you know they're going to use some things, this might really help a lot as well. Um, but use it with caution. And, and remember, it does work through the client. So you, if you're using Storefront as your interface, this isn't going to work for you. Right. Um, next few items are, I think, really interesting. One's auto login. Um, and Originally, I, was, I always thought auto login was mainly for Citrix virtual apps, right? You wouldn't use it for desktops. Until I was getting prepping for the session, I realized, well, that's kind of silly. When I found out how much time you can actually save with this, figured out a way to do it for desktops. And I wasn't the first one to figure it out. There's a bunch of people in this room who figured it out first. <laughs> I, I would right? actually argue that this makes more sense for the client operating system than yeah, just the Yeah, I agree. Because um, here's the thing, on Citrix Virtual Apps, the first user to log in to any host is going to take that hit, but everybody else is going to be fine because he already took that hit. But for a VDI session, everyone's the first one, right? So it matters. So it's interesting. What, what happens here is when you log in first, 
Windows preloads a lot of files and applications and it's pulling it. So and it's pulling, a, you know, if you're doing PVS, right? It's got to pull it from the PVS server, but it's basically caching that login stuff. Um, so what the auto login is doing, it's going to pre-cache a bunch of stuff in there to make it faster the second time around. So, so I, sorry, one quick note. I actually measured this. So Windows, by default, when the user logs on, is touching over 1,000 different files. So it's a huge, huge, huge potential saving. Right. And I show a little bit kind of the, the impact of this on the next slide. Um, but how to do it? It's actually relatively easy. You configure an auto logon in the registry, right? Um, and what you can do is in your image, have the auto logon configured. There's a sysinternals tool that can help you encrypt the password if you want to do that. Um, and then you create a login script for that user that when they log in, you clear that stuff out, right? Um, and then you log them out, right? So it's actually relatively easy to do. The key is if you're doing it on VDI, you have to disable automatic uh, reboot on logout, right? Because otherwise it's just going to keep rebooting. Um, and then you have to have a log off script that does the reboot, right, for regular users. And you have to differentiate between your auto logon user and that regular user. Um, there's a, a few CTPs that have good articles on this on the internet. You can look at um, James Rankin. You can look at Dennis, I think, his blog on this, and George Spears all have stuff on how to do this. Uh, I don't, it's not really that hard, but it can be really beneficial for that. The next line on here is auto execution. That's the same idea, but running applications. Right? So if you have an application that is really big and it takes a long time to load, if you're doing auto logon, figure out a way to load that application in the auto logon so it starts up closes down, it's going to pre-cache most of those files for the application as well, so that when the user logs in, it's going to be quicker for that at the same time. Um, and that one might be a little more interesting even for Citrix Virtual Apps, because not every application will be started by that first user that logs in. Um, last thing on the list is that same idea. If you're doing AppV and you're not pre-caching your uh, AppV packages, that same thing would apply. And you know, if AppV is streaming, the disk can take, can take a long time, right? So you can get benefit from doing that as well. So in preparation for this session, kind of all these ideas and all these recommendations, and I wanted to see what the impact was of these different technologies. Um, caveat here, so I did this in my lab. My lab has six-year-old servers. They're real servers, right? But they're not too fast. Uh, I do have 10 gig networking, I do have flash storage, but it's not like the arrays you guys use and everything. So you can take all these times and squish them down for what you'll see, but just to give you an idea of the, of the differences between them. I started with the baseline Windows 10 1803 with a few UWP apps installed. Most of them removed, but some of them installed. And if you just do that with the default optimizer template, right, and nothing else, you can see the times we got there, 72 seconds on PVS and 60 seconds on MCS, right? If I add in streaming with redirected folders, which I would say is the majority of what our customers do, actually, um, that drops quite a bit, right, down to 55 for both. If I remove the redirected folders, now we're talking, right, now we're close to half the time, right? Um, and then if I do the auto log and stuff, we really are lower than half the time for that to make that happen. So it kind of gives you an idea of those different things we talked about and the impact it might have on your login. Um, and then remember, your times will be lower than these, right? Because your equipment will be better than what I tested with. And just to give you an idea of the other two technologies there, I did FS Logics profile containers, um, and then the app layering user layer, just to see. And that, so those were just base, not using any of the other technologies off the, the base. And you can see it's you know definitely quicker because your profile's created already than the original one. Um, but not as quick as some of the other technologies out there because it does have to load a filter driver and load the disk and, and get that stuff to work. Um, but thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, please fill out your uh, session. And I got one, one more thing that I just wanted to ask everyone. How many of you have heard about the CityGeek Stack Zone? Okay, cool. So if anyone is interested, I have the stickers with me, so just come to us after the session, and I'm happy to hand them over. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, everyone. Thanks show. for coming.